Hello, my name is Mark Johnston. I'm the program manager of the Burn Center at Regions Hospital. Today we're going to spend some time talking about initial burn care and specifically the ABCs of initial burn care. The ABCs are airway, breathing, and circulation, and then we'll get into more aspects of the secondary survey as well. I think the big takeaway message from today should be that burn is just another form of trauma. Most of us in our practice see more trauma patients than we do burn patients. And so it's really important that we keep that in the back of our mind that we have to focus on the trauma injuries and assessing and treating those first. We'll get to the burn care and eventually take care of that. But if you start taking care of the burn before the other trauma aspects are addressed, these patients can suffer more fatal or life-threatening injuries. So it's really important that we always focus on the trauma first. The trauma should always trump the burn. It hurts me a little bit to tell you that the burn is not a priority, but as we walk through this, I think it'll become pretty evident. I often get asked about burn patients and their mortality rate, and actually it's an uh, easy formula to figure out um, whether a burn patient is going to survive or not. Um, we use some prognostic variables that help us determine the mortality. First and foremost is the patient's age and their size or depth of their burn injury. So when we take those two, the patient's age and their size or their percent of body surface area burn, and we add those two numbers together, we get what's called a BAU score. It's B-A-U-X. That BAU score should be less than 120 for that patient to survive that injury. It's when that bow score approaches 130 or certainly into 140 range that that becomes a fatal burn injury. When we talk about the depth of injury, when we calculate burn percentage, we only calculate second and third degree burns. We don't calculate first degrees in that um, total body surface area percentage. The other aspects of prognostic variables are an inhalation injury. If you take that bow score and your patient has a significant inhalation injury, you can add 17 points to that bow score, which would be 120, and then adding 17 points would make that bow score 137. That becomes a fatal injury. The other aspects of trauma, so the example I would give is a patient driving their car who crashes into a power pole. They sustain bilateral femur fractures and a pelvis fracture, and then the car starts on fire and they suffer a burn injury as well. That other trauma will make that mortality of that patient significantly higher. So just kind of keep those in mind. We'll add the age to the size of the burn injury, and then if they have an inhalation injury, you can add 17 points to that score. For trauma, there's no additional points that you can add to that score, but just know that other trauma in a burn patient makes their, makes their mortality significantly less, or makes their significantly greater. Different types of burns, we can break them down into four categories. Thermal are by far the most common types of burn injuries we see. Those uh, external temperature raises the temperature of the skin and the cells in the skin and the tissues. That's what happens in a superficial or first degree burn where the skin kind of turns uh, pink, maybe red. Um, and those cells are just injured. Those cells are able to repair themselves. You may slough your epidermis, um, but those cells can repair themselves um, and it uh, takes about three to five days and that patient will do just fine. It's when the cells become um, injured beyond repair or they're dead, that's when we have to do the actual burn surgery and excise those cells and put on new cells in the form of a skin graft. We do see some radiation burns. Radiation burns are defined as exposure to ultraviolet rays from the sun or other sources such as radiation treatments after uh, cancer treatments. Chemical burns are related to strong acids, alkalis, detergents, or solvents. Again, those can be superficial, where you can have a superficial chemical burn, your skin becomes injured, and they can be actually full thickness injuries as well. And then electrical burns, those are sometimes called the tip of the iceberg, because what you see on the surface of the skin is not is minimal compared to what's burning underneath the surface of their skin. So often we have to go looking for those injuries. Um, and I'll give you some examples. We'll look at some photos of some of these um, types of uh, burns a little toward the end of my presentation. Electrical burns, it doesn't really matter. It can be alternating current or direct current. 
Um, it doesn't really matter the type of the occurrence of the current will what's concerning is the amount of amperage the force of that electrical current or sometimes the voltage how much uh, electrical current is actually present pre-hospital evaluation what we want you to do as soon as you arrive on the scene is stop the burning process whatever that means if the patient's on fire obviously we have to put the fire out if the patient is on an electrical wire, again, making sure the scene is safe, but then uh, moving that patient to safety. Um, if there's a chemical, getting that chemical off the skin as fast as possible. Really, whatever you can do to stop the burning process is going to be your focus early on. I get a lot of questions about then what sort of dressings do we put on the burn and it really you should not be worried about dressings again you have a lot other things a lot more priorities to worry about than treating the burn if you find yourself worrying about dressings or wanting to put dressings on you're going to miss an aspect of care that could potentially injure that patient further or kill that patient so cooling the burn for more than about two to four minutes does not save tissue and really what it does is make the patient hypo thermic. Burn patients lose their ability to thermoregulate and it's important that we do everything we can to keep them at normal temperature or even hyperthermic. So putting wet dressings on, pouring water on the burns, all of those things are not saving tissue and they're just making your patient cold. Maybe there's an indication for continued cooling if it's thick fluids, tar, chemicals, certainly things like that, um, that would continue to warn putting water on a burn, that makes sense. But for a straight thermal burn, just remember that that tissue gets back to normal temperature after about two to four minutes. <clears throat> Now, if you have less than a 10% body surface area burn, so if I burn my arm, my arm is 9% of my body, you can put a wet dressing on that. Um, it will help with pain control. Certainly a nice uh, wet dressing on a burn does help with pain control. And if it's less than 10% of your body surface area burn, you won't become hypothermic. So it's okay for smaller burns to put wet dressings. Where we get concerned is when we see patients that are 40 or 50 percent burn injuries and they come on uh, come into our hospital uh, with wet dressings um, those patients don't do well um, and will become hypothermic very quickly then we approach it as any other trauma so the abcs are absolutely important all burn patients should get oxygen we'll talk about that a little more and then stabilizing the spine if it's indicated these are the ABCs of burn patients. They should look very similar to you as the ABCs of trauma patients. Um, we're gonna talk about these all in detail um, as we walk through here. So cervical spine stabilization, this should be no different for any patient that you have if it's a burn patient. Um, if a patient would need this cervical collar, we put cervical collars on burn patients. You're maintaining their head and neck in neutral position absolutely should be done on a burn patient. If your patient would be immobilized on a rigid spine board because again of their trauma injuries, that would be warranted in a burn patient. We just don't want you to change your practice at all um, or not follow your protocol based on the burn injury. Burn patients all get their spine stabilized just like you would um, even if they weren't burned. And then as far as airway goes, certainly people are concerned about uh, burn patients and the airway edema that can be uh, can occur early, can be rapid and could be life threatening. So when we look at this guy, are we concerned about his airway? Well, certainly I would be concerned about his airway. Now the question is, would you take advanced maneuvers? Would you maybe intubate this patient? And I challenge you, most people would say, oh, absolutely I would. And I challenge you just a little bit to think about this burn injury and I can give you the rest of his story. So this guy was driving his car along the highway. The car overheated. He stopped on the side of the road. He got out, opened the hood, and then opened the radiator cap and had this radiator fluid splash onto his face. Now, given that scenario, are you concerned about his airway? I would still be concerned about his airway, but maybe not as concerned. It's really hard, almost impossible, to get that liquid from that radiator into your mouth 
down your throat into your lungs and cause an inhalation injury. It just doesn't happen. Um, I look at this guy and I look at some other indicators as well. So does he have facial hair? Um, he, you know, it's not really all that reliable. Didn't have a beard or a mustache before his injury. Maybe eyebrows, but he also looks like a guy who didn't have much for eyebrows um, before his injury. I look at his hair on top of his head, but he's got this nice clear line across his forehead. So he was wearing a baseball cap at the time of his injury. So it makes that uh, assessment of his hair on top of his head unreliable. Um, this guy was transported by a local EMS crew and was not intubated on arrival, which was great, and we did not intubate him and he did just fine. Is he going to have edema to his face? Certainly. His eyelids, you can see, are swollen shut. His nose looks edematous. All of those things are going to happen, but his airway is not going to swell shut. It just does not happen on a liquid burn or a scald burn. Other uh, signs of impending airway disaster that I look at, I kind of mentioned the facial hair and nasal hair. If you see blistering about the mouth, absolutely that would be a concern. If they have a uh, patient has soot on their tongue or in their pharynx, I would be concerned about that. If the patient has any wheezing, <clears throat> Or if they have carbonaceous sputum, that's absolutely a concern. Now, wheezing can be hit or miss, but the presence of carbonaceous sputum, and I had my patients at Kleenex and tell them to cough into that Kleenex. And if they cough into that Kleenex and in there are specks of carbonaceous deposits in their sputum, that's a clear sign of an airway injury or an inhalation injury. If they have a hoarse voice or difficulty swallowing, if they have labored respirations, if they're restless, confused, or combative, they're telling you they're hypoxic. I take all of these things, not just one or two, maybe if I have three of them, that's concerning to me that this patient needs an advanced airway maneuver. Okay, let's look at this guy. So this is a young kid. He has a flame burn, so certainly not a skull burn, which makes me a little more concerned about an airway injury. His story was he was sitting outside uh, around a bonfire. One of his friends um, took a spray paint can, threw it in the fire to see what would happen. That spray paint can heated up and obviously exploded. There was a big mushroom cloud, kind of a fire. Um, he was sitting on a lawn chair, it knocked him over off of his lawn chair. Um, <clears throat> they called 911 when EMS got there. He was walking around the fire complaining that his face hurt. He had no signs of respiratory distress. He had no strider. He was oxygenating just fine. Does he need to be intubated? Typically not. So what was in his favor is he had a mechanism of an outside fire. So that can heat it up. It's a limited amount of fuel. It blew up and that air, hot air, is able to dissipate to the atmosphere. As it dissipates to the atmosphere, he's able to not stay in that environment and remove himself um, and not inhale that superheated gases or flames or chemicals. Now, he's got hair on top of his head. He didn't have a baseball cap on. I mentioned all the other signs of respiratory distress were not present. He's got a little blister on his forehead, which is concerning. He had enough heat there to cause some injury to his face, but not about his mouth, so it's a little less concerning. He again was transported by a local EMS crew and did just fine, never remained, never got intubated, um, remained extubated, they're not intubated the whole time. Um, is he a guy that we would put in his room at 10 o'clock at night and say, okay, sleep well, we'll check on you at six o'clock in the morning? Absolutely not. We need to keep a close eye on him and have a low threshold to do an advanced airway if he needs one. So certainly I mentioned the edema can occur um, early on. Um, we give these patients extra IV fluid, which is part of their resuscitation, and that can make that edema more profound. So certainly like here, you see eyelids are swollen shut, lips are gonna protrude. Um, I thought this was an interesting photo. So this guy was transferred by EMS, and he came in uh, completely supine on the stretcher. Um, his mechanism was very similar to the other kid with the spray paint can um, in the fire, but he was transported supine with no spine or no other injuries to his neck um, or back. 
So my question to them was, could you have transported him with his head of his bed elevated? A very basic maneuver. Um, and yes, he could have been. Um, and that would have helped some of that edema from occurring. So how about this guy? Need to be intubated? Well, I think we can all agree that an advanced airway would be um, in his differential um, uh, in this scenario by looking at what you see here. So. Um, He's got this nasal uh, trumpet, which is absolutely doing nothing to keep his airway open. Um, he's got burns on the top of his head, uh, and his hair is essentially burned off. Um, he's got some full thickness burn injuries. Um, a non-rebreather oxygen mask is not doing any good for him at all. Um, so I asked the question, why are we standing around taking photos of this guy instead of doing advanced airway maneuver? Um, and the, the answer is that this, his entire body looked like what you see here. So this is a fatal burn injury. Um, we opted to put him on comfort care and just let him pass away. And he passed away shortly after this photo was taken. You can see up on his left neck, he's got a central line into his subclavian vein, and that was so we could give him some uh, medicines to keep him comfortable. Um, but certainly we're not doing anything here to maintain a good open airway. Um, so I think it's important when we talk about uh, airways to talk about different types of airways. So the gold standard on a burn patient is truly an endotracheal tube. Um, the superglottic airways absolutely do nothing to maintain an open airway in a burn patient. If the mechanism is that their trachea is going to swell and it's going to close off their airway, the only um, strategy should be employed is an endotracheal tube in their airway. Now, I talk with a lot of rural EMS providers that don't have the ability to get an endotracheal tube in. Um, and so they say, well, what, what should I do? And my advice to them is to find somebody who can get to your scene to get that airway in place, get that endotracheal tube, because that truly is the only airway that is going to help this patient uh, in the long term. Now, would I opt to put a uh, eye gel in a patient with a burn injury? Uh, again, knowing that it's not going to keep their trachea open, but maybe the only thing you can do, I guess it's not harmful, um, but it's certainly not helpful. So work really hard to get somebody to your scene, whether that's a helicopter where you maybe wouldn't normally call one, or uh, ALS intercept or something to get this patient to get an endotracheal tube. Once we have that endotracheal tube in place, it really needs to stay in place. And if you can see from the photo, the left side of this kid's cheek, uh, that tape is not holding that tube in place, right? And so we're at risk of losing that endotracheal tube. Um, and if that endotracheal tube comes out, the likelihood of getting another one back in is very low. More time has passed, so more edema has occurred, and then having this endotracheal tube in an airway is causing some irritation, which will cause more edema. And if that tube comes out, our only option then is a surgical airway. And for those of you that know landmarks for surgical airways, um, they're pretty much non-existent in this kid. So I would be really careful about getting that tube uh, once it's in place to keeping it in place. And I don't really care what that is. I guess if this tape is going to uh, work to hold it in place, it does wrap around the kid's head. Um, just know that the tape isn't going to stick to these wet, weepy burn wounds. I often facetiously will say, um, if all you have is shoelaces, I'd rather have a shoelace uh, tied around this kid's head and around that endotracheal tube than I would this tape. This is a device that we use in the hospital, um, and you can see again it's that, got that concept where it wraps around that patient's back of his head and around his neck and then secures upon itself. Um, there's a little piece of Velcro here, um, but uh, you can see on the left side of his face, uh, there's a safety pin. So that safety pin just provides an extra layer of protection on that tube coming out. Because again, if you lose this tube, the likelihood of getting it back down is not going to be very high. And this guy, again, doesn't have a great landmarks for uh, surgical airway. A little bit about carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide is a byproduct of incomplete combustion. It has 200 times the affinity to your hemoglobin than oxygen does, so it will stick to your hemoglobin. 
in equal parts of oxygen and equal parts of carbon monoxide, carbon monoxide will always win. It'll attach to your hemoglobin and you'll circulate that around your uh, body to your end organs. Um, these patients, because of their hypoxia, will have some central nervous system complications. They'll be confused, they'll maybe have a loss of memory and have a headache. If they're unconscious and relate no other trauma at all, we assume it's related to carbon monoxide. The treatment for, uh, so carbon monoxide accounts for 80% of all burn deaths on the scene. 95% of patients that are dead on the scene are gonna be dead from carbon monoxide. So contrary to popular belief, patients don't burn to death in fires. If you can get a carbon monoxide level, um, we're looking for levels less than about 8%. A typical pack-a-day smoker walks around with a carbon monoxide level of 8%, and we don't get too worried about that. So certainly in that 10 to 15 range, uh, these patients will have no symptoms. Um, once that number starts to climb, they will have some central nervous system dysfunctions or an altered level of consciousness. If that CO level is up to 50 to 70, maybe even 80, those patients will die without your intervention. So it's really important that we, one, assess what their carbon monoxide level is. And remember, pulse oximeters aren't able to do that. If you have a co-oximeter device, that's able to tell you what their carbon monoxide level is. But don't rely on a pulse oximeter. A pulse oximeter really only tells you how much of your hemoglobin is saturated with something. And it doesn't know if it's saturated with carbon monoxide or oxygen. So pulse oximeters are completely unreliable in the presence of carbon monoxide. Once we have that um, carbon monoxide level assessed, we treat it and we treat it with 100% oxygen. Whether it's a non-rebreather or an endotracheal tube and the patient on the ventilator, we need to deliver 100%. And that's why I say all burn patients should receive 100% oxygenation until we know for sure that their carbon monoxide level is non-existent. The treatment of carbon monoxide with hyperbaric oxygen is absolutely controversial. Um, where it has been found to be helpful in patients uh, that have a long exposure time to carbon monoxide. So in that 14 to 22 hours of isolated carbon, carbon monoxide is where hyperbaric oxygen has been found to be helpful. If a patient has a short time of uh, exposure to um, carbon monoxide, they don't need hyperbaric oxygen and it's not helpful at all. 100% non-rebreather oxygen will drive that level down to normal in no time. So don't transport these patients to a hyperbaric chamber um, if it's a burn patient. They don't need that and oftentimes they don't end up in the chamber um, and uh, they're just treated with passive um, oxygenation. So most burn patients, their exposure time is short. Um, most of the time it's 10 minutes, maybe upwards of 20 minutes. If they're exposed to carbon monoxide longer than 20 minutes, they're gonna die. Uh, if they're exposed less time, uh, your 100% non-rebreather oxygen is enough to uh, remove that uh, carbon monoxide from the hemoglobin. The other gas that we should talk about is uh, hydrogen cyanide. Hydrogen cyanide is um, uh, occurs in structure fires, um, and it's when burning synthetics, fibers, plastics, polymers, wool, silk, those kind of things burn. So certainly structure fires. Um, these patients with an elevated carbon uh, hydrogen cyanide level, these patients will be unresponsive. Um, patients with a mild exposure to hydrogen cyanide most often don't even know that they were exposed to that. Um, there's really no good test. There is a blood test that can detect cyanide, but that's a send out blood test even for our hospital. Um, and it takes about 72 hours to get results. So these patients, if they have a high exposure to cyanide, they'll be sick, they'll be hypotensive, they'll have some dysrhythmias, they'll have some cardiac arrest. Once at the hospital, we can do some tests without doing the actual cyanide test to kind of find out um, if they've been exposed to cyanide. First and foremost, a lactate um, would be indicated and a lactate greater than 10 millimoles per liter um, would be exceptionally high. Our patients do have high lactate levels, but not that high. 
If we're able to do a venous oxygen saturation um, and it's 10, only 10% 10 less than the arterial saturation, that would be an indicator that the cyanide isn't being used on a cellular level. So what you're breathing in and circulating through your body is being returned on the venous side at essentially the same amount. That would be an indication because that cyanide doesn't allow you to use oxygen on the cellular level. And then these patients may be hyperglycemic as well. Um, this cascade of these three um, lab results um, would tell us that the patient's been exposed to cyanide. The treatment for the cyano kit is hydroxycoalbalamin or the cyano kit. It takes uh, that uh, cyanide and chelates it to vitamin B12 and we excrete it in their urine. The dose is there, five grams given slowly over 10 minutes and then you can repeat it once. Um, the cyano kit sometimes is practically not um, all that uh, helpful in um, ambulance services maybe. Uh, it's a very expensive kit um, and it expires in a relatively short time. So again, in patients that are exposed to cyanide, I think the treatment is 100% oxygen and then just get into a hospital or to a place that has a cyano kit. If there's a significant exposure, um, they, can, they can administer the kit. The other component <clears throat> with uh, breathing is the actual mechanics of being able to breathe. So if I need to breathe, I will create a negative inner thoracic pressure in my chest and I will draw air into my lungs. I create that negative pressure by expanding my chest. If I have a circumferential burn around my torso, so all the way around, chest, back, flanks, completely around and it's a full thickness injury, that skin loses its ability to stretch. You know, when it loses that ability to stretch, it becomes rigid and you have no compliance. So in this patient, you can see he's being positive pressure ventilated on a ventilator. If that escherotomy wasn't in, pre in place, that skin would not be able to stretch, his chest would not be able to expand, he wouldn't be able to breathe. I equate it very similar to somebody coming up to you and giving you a bear hug and holding on really tight and you know how you can't breathe. That's what happens with these circumferential torso injuries that are full thickness. The treatment for that is what you see here in the photo is an escherotomy. So it's horizontal and vertical incisions across that chest plate to allow that chest to expand every time a breath is delivered. If you're bagging this patient and you squeeze that bag, you'll meet a ton of resistance and you won't be able to get that air into that lungs. That's an indication that this escherotomy, chest escherotomy is necessary. Now I'm not telling you in the field to do chest escherotomies. Typically we don't see these injuries for up to six or eight hours after the burn injury. By that time, most often the patient is at the hospital. So this is a surgical procedure. It really should be done by a surgeon and not out in the field. The treatment of smoke inhalation, we're not very good at fixing that. We don't know how to heal burden lungs. We can't obviously heal a burden trachea, um, so it's really supportive. So these patients will certainly be on ventilators. Um, I say we avoid antibiotics, we don't necessarily avoid them, but they're not gonna prevent infections. They're used, to, uh, antibiotics are used to treat infections. So we will do sputum cultures, um, bronchial alveolar lavages, and we'll find out what's growing there, and that's when we would prescribe the appropriate antibiotics. And then we don't give steroids to burn patients generally. Steroids in burn patients will increase their mortality by increasing their infection risk. So that's another tool in our toolbox that we can't use. That's why these inhalation injuries can be so devastating of injuries. And then on to circulation, if there's no pulse, we have to give them a pulse. So we start CPR and we check for co other causes and start treating those causes. Now certainly easier said than done. Um, the burn patient should always have a pulse. Burn patient should always be awake and talking to you. If they're not, there's other things that are happening besides the burn and you have to figure out what that is and start treating that. As far as IV fluids go, we often will say one in the field and then the second one in the ED. So pre-hospital folks, you can certainly give an, start an IV, uh, get one started. If it's a kid, 
and I'm talking about less than probably 10 uh, years old, um, I wouldn't spend a whole lot of time treating or trying to get IV started in the field. Just get that patient to the hospital. Not that the hospital is any better than starting IVs than you guys are, but it's important that you have more resources there um, and more people making attempts. If you're gonna get an IV started in an adult, large bore IVs are great. 16 to 18 gauge works fine. A single intraosseous uh, needle works great. We can do resuscitation or start resuscitation through that. And then eventually, like in the bottom photo, those patients may need a central venous line um, and uh, may need that prior to secondary transport. But most often those patients are gonna end up uh, getting that central venous line once they get to us. There's a debate that's currently going on in the burn world and has for many years about crystalloid or colloid infusions. And at this point, early resuscitation, um, there's no benefit and uh, colloids are not available. Certainly you're not carrying them in your ambulance, um, so they're not all that important to get done. Um, but crystalloid infusion is important and we need to give crystalloid fluids. So lactated ringers or normal saline are the preferred crystalloids to use. Um, obviously most of you wouldn't be carrying normal saline uh, or wouldn't be carrying lactated ringers in the ambulance. So normal saline is fine up to about three liters. Using um, normal saline more than three liters will uh, increase the base deficit. It'll make your patient hypernatremic and hyperchloremic. Um, lactated ringers is more plasma-like, so that's the fluid that we would prefer. This is the initial resuscitation, so 125 cc's an hour of lactated ringers or normal saline for kids that are five years old and younger. If the kid is between six and 13 years old, we would recommend 250 cc's per hour of lactated ringers. And if they're older than 14, the formula is 500 cc's per hour of lactated ringers. So that's getting IV fluids or getting IV started initially and then getting IV fluids started at this rate. We'll figure out the actual fluid resuscitation rate a little bit long or a little bit later on in our assessment. But at this point, this is just getting IVs uh, started and IV fluid running. And then on to disability, so assessing disability in burn patients. Burn patients should always be alert. They should be yelling at you, it hurts, it hurts, help me, help me. If they're not alert, you have to figure out what's causing them to not be alert. And again, easier said than done, but fix that. That's why we're not focusing on the burn. We're focusing on other injuries that are gonna kill this patient before the burn will. Burns will not, burns alone will not cause a disability. Now maybe the person was assaulted and then started on fire. Um, so certainly the assault may be hit over the head uh, with baseball bat. Um, that alone will cause the disability. So figure that piece out and then go on. Um, uh, the burn again will not cause the disability. Exposing the patients, getting all their clothing off and all their jewelry is really important. Um, looking at what you need to look at and then covering them back up and protecting them from hypothermia. If you have warm blankets or warming lights, that's great. It may mean turning on the heat on the back, in the back of the ambulance on a nice hot 98 degree day. It's really important that we protect these patients from hypothermia. And again, that's why we don't recommend the use of wet dressings. These wet dressings will cause that patient to be more hypothermic. So our standard dressing is a dry sheet covered up with warm blankets. We'll put, take care of dressings when those patients arrive to the burn center. You don't have to worry about that. Just cover them up and then keep them nice and warm. And then roll them over, look for other additional, additional injuries. Good head to toe assessment is absolutely important in a burn patient just like any other patient. And then on to fluid management, with this, which is the F in the resuscitation uh, ABCs. So we only resuscitate burn patients that have a greater than 20% body surface area burn. I mentioned my arm. If I burn my arm, that's 9% of my body. I don't need IV fluid resuscitation. We can still get IV fluid started, get them running at that initial rate, but then once they get to the hospital, we're gonna figure out that their burn is less than 20% 
and then we will probably just give them oral resuscitation. Same, same thing goes for kids. If it's a kid and their burn is greater than 15%, that's when we're gonna do true IV fluid resuscitation. Uh, if it's less than that 15%, we can just give them some oral fluids. To calculate actual fluid resuscitation, we need to estimate the burn size and the depth. Um, again, only counting second and third degree burns. And then once we have the patient's weight, we can calculate the actual IV fluid resuscitation needs. The rule of nines hopefully is familiar to you. Um, it does cause some confusion in folks that don't use it often. I use it a lot. Um, so to me, it's pretty simple. I keep in mind that my head is 9% of my body and my arm is 9% of my body. My legs are twice as big as my arms, so they get 18%. And I think of 9% for my chest, 9% for my abdomen, 9% for my upper back, and 9% for my lower back. On here you'll see that the chest is 18%. The chest means the anterior torso uh, from neck to uh, waistline. And the back is the entire back, 18%. I break them down into nines just so I can keep that straight. If you're gonna remember um, the adult rule of nines, um, I would recommend remembering the adult rule of nines over the kid rule of nines. Um, the child rule of nines is a little more complex in that their legs are shorter and their heads are bigger. So their head is 18%, we're opposed to the adult rule of nine, the head is 9%, and a kid it's 18. Their legs are shorter, so they get 13 and a half, um, whereas an adult leg is 8%. So using the adult rule of nines, if I burn my face, my chest, my abdomen, and the fronts of both my arms, what percentage am I? Again, it's my face, my chest, my abdomen, and the fronts of both my arms. So occasionally I hear 45%, and where they get 45% from is they take nine for the head, nine for each arm, which is 27 then, um, 36 and 45. And I didn't say my entire head was burned, it's just my face. And I didn't say my entire arms were burned, it's just the front of both my arms. So the correct answer should be 31 or 31 and a half percent. The front of my arm is four and a half, and the other arm is four and a half, giving me a combined total of nine percent. And I get nine for my chest, which is 18, nine for my abdomen, which is 27, and then it's just my face, so roughly half of my head. So that's where 27 plus four and a half would give us 31%. It's really important that we actually use a formula or we use a calculation strategy, um, because if you just are guessing, you're gonna overestimate your burn percentage almost every time. Then on to fluid resuscitation, I have the photo because it's a lot of fluid. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the Parkland formula. I don't want you to memorize this at all because the Parkland formula is a formula that we don't use anymore. I just put it in there for some histor historical perspective. So the Parkland formula is a formula that has been around since the 1950s. And what it said is that for a 100 kilogram man that's burned 40% of his body, you would get four cc's of fluid times every kilogram times every percent. So in this example, four times 100 kilograms times 40% would equal 16,000 cc's. You would get half of that amount of fluid or 8,000 cc's in the first eight hours, which is where we'd get that 1,000 cc's an hour. And then the next half of that 16,000 would run over the next 16 hours, so roughly 500 cc's an hour. A transferring hospital, um, we used to teach this formula to, to them. It was half the patient's weight, weight, which is 50, times half his percent, which is 20. 50 times 20 is 1,000. It gave you that starting fluid rate. This is now the adjusted fluid rate. This is once we have the weight of the patient and the TBSA are known we can calculate that adjusted fluid rate. So on the right side, you see the numbers in red, two, three, three, four. So in adults greater than 14 years old, if they've been injured by a thermal component, flame or scald, 
Instead of that four cc's that Parkland recommended, they get two cc's. So it's two times their weight in kilograms times their percent of body surface area burn. If that child is injured by flame or scal scalded contact, um, and they're less than 14 years old, they get three cc's times their weight times their percent. And if it's an infant or child less than 30 kilos, they get three cc's, but they also get a maintenance fluid rate. Kids that young don't have the glycogen stores or the fat stores that adults do, so they run out of sugar really fast, and we need to augment that sugar by giving them D5 uh, lactated ringers at a maintenance rate. And then electrical injuries, <clears throat> I mentioned that we don't necessarily see the burn on the surface of their skin, so we don't really have a good total body surface area percentage. So we estimate uh, the amount of fluid by increasing their amount of fluid they get to four cc's times their weight in kilograms times their percent of body surface area burn. Now, multiplying these will still give you a big number. We don't need to give half of that in the first eight hours and half in the next 16, but we're trying to get a fluid rate per hour. So you once you take these numbers and you multiply them, if you divide by 16, that gives us the starting fluid rate. Once we have that starting fluid rate or the adjusted fluid rate, we don't just run that continually. I'm just giving you this as an example for perspective. Um, once that a patient arrives to us, we use a nurse-driven resuscitation protocol. We're basically looking at urine output um, as a primary indicator and then adjusting fluids every hour based on their urine output. Gone are the days of giving fluid boluses of uh, crystalloid. If a person's urine output would drop off, our answer at the time was to give them a liter of fluid. Um, we don't do that anymore. It just causes the fluid to leak out. I mentioned we are, uh, there's no place for colloids in the early resuscitation, but we are using colloid resuscitation earlier. And I'll explain more about that. Um, we accept a lower urine output range, so 0.3 to 0.5 cc's or mils per kilo per hour is what we're using. Um, we know that that's a low urine output range um, and because we're not circulating as much volume in these patients then, um, we have a vasopressin protocol. That's our standard vasoactive medication that we use as a first line of defense. So once we're giving all these fluids, we know that that fluid, the primary mechanism behind resuscitation is that um, shock is both hypovolemic and cellular in burn patients. The exact pathophysiology is unknown, but we do know that capillaries become permeable. And as our capillaries become permeable, that fluid leaks out of those capillaries into the third space, and that's why these people become very edematous. The goal with this resuscitation protocol is to not over resuscitate or give these patients too much volume, which we did for many, many years, um, give them the right amount of volume. The role in colloids is those big protein molecule fluids then, once we give those earlier, we're able to pull that fluid that's now in the third space back into the vasculature. It works by simple osmosis and we're trying to pull that fluid back in so it's not sitting in the third space and just sitting there. We want it in the vasculature where it's doing some good. The primary goal of burn resuscitation always has and always will be is to preserve and restore tissue perfusion and to prevent end, or, end organ ischemia. That's why burn patients are getting fluid resuscitation. Then the continued assessment, this is what you're all doing on the left side. This is your sample, right? The signs and symptoms are the burn injury and then AMPLE. Um, we're concerned about a tetanus shot. We will address that when they get to the hospital. It's not something you have to worry about. And then the events surrounding the injury. The right side of that screen is the patient's age, their habits, and their dry weight. That should be in our continued sample history. So because this is a burn talk, we should talk a little bit about skin. And this is a good depiction of what your skin looks like by cross-section. So if we're talking about a first degree burn, you can see that the burn is just into the epidermis. It doesn't involve under, un, any underlying structures. 
And that's why we don't uh, count that in that um, total body surface area calculation. There are two types of second degree burns, a superficial second degree burn and a deep second degree burn. We call these uh, sometimes partial thickness injuries. So you can have a superficial partial thickness burn or a deep partial thickness burn. So a couple of examples of some superficial burns. The one on the right is pretty clear that that uh, occurred from a sunburn injury. Um, again, 0% of body surface area burn because all of that is superficial, but you'll see that nice clear line of demarcation. The one on the left can be debated whether that's a superficial burn or a partial thickness burn, uh, first degree or second degree because of the presence of blisters. Some would argue that that's a second degree burn. If you uh, look at the nature of those blisters, they're almost like a tissue paper appearance uh, burn. So that would be an indication of a very superficial second degree burn. Um, but it's kind of right on the line, whether it's a first or second degree burn. Um, certainly some uh, underwear was present when this injury happened, but you can see out on the periphery of those injuries, um, that it's not that nice clear line. Um, so this is actually a scald burn. So that liquid comes in contact with your skin and kind of spreads over a period or over a surface area um, and doesn't cause that nice clear line. Um, we'll look at a, a structure fire burn um, and you'll notice that in this instance here, this is a very clean burn. There's not the carbon deposits that you would see in a structure fire burn. I'll show you an example a little bit. Um, this is a, um, another example of more deeper uh, thermal injuries. So the one on the left is claws from a closing, clothing iron. You can kind of see that pattern. Um, and uh, as the iron heated up, it caused a deeper injury. Um, this is actually an assault, and you can tell um, uh, that the deeper injury um, was actually caused by the uh, hotter iron and then it being held in place uh, for a longer period of time. So it's not uncommon to see superficial injuries surrounded by uh, deeper or more full thickness injuries, and that's what you see in that photo on the left. Uh, the one on the right, uh, upper right, we can see that that is an older injury. Uh, that skin is starting to uh, form new cells, epithelializing along the edge near the abdomen. But I want you to look at that upper right uh, shoulder. Um, that is where the skin is trying to heal itself. It's not doing a very good job of healing itself. And so we call that pseudo eschar. Um, so uh, what we need to do at that point is take the kid to the operating room and excise that burn and see what's underneath it. If we excise that and there's good blood flow to that area um, and we can actually see white heads, little pimple looking things, um, those are skin buds that are present and we would expect that to heal itself. But it's important we do that um, <clears throat> early on because we don't want that to kind of um, sit there for three weeks or longer or it'll sig form a significant scar. So it's important that we get, try to get all of the excised burn off in the first three weeks. The one on the bottom right is from a uh, guy who was uh, cooking and started a flannel shirt on fire. Um, again, you can see more distal to that elbow, um, some uh, more you know, superficial partial thickness injury. But as we get up his shoulder up to where the head of his humerus essentially would be, you would see that pale white area and that would be indicative of probably a full thickness injury where the blood blood supply hasn't been reestablished to that area. Now, if it's small enough, that can still heal in on its own. Um, <clears throat> but if at that three week period, um, that is still looking pale white, <clears throat> we would have to make the decision to uh, go to the operating room and excise and graft that. Um, this is some lower extremity burns and you can see uh, the nature of a full thickness burn there. Uh, very tan, leathery. Um, that skin is no longer pliable. Um, it would feel uh, kind of like a tree stump would. Um, and so when I look at that, I get concerned about circulation distal to that injury. We talked about those circumferential thorax burns where we can't breathe. This happens with extremity injuries where you can't get blood flow to that area past the injury. 
So in this example, um, it's a little hard to see that upper photo has an escherotomy along the medial compartment next to the tibia to allow blood flow to that, um, to back to that, to restore blood flow back to that foot. This is a better example of uh, what ended up being, uh, what started out as an escherotomy ended up being a fasciotomy. So again, a super or circumferential full thickness injury to this leg. And you can see maybe down by the toes, we started to do that escherotomy, uh, got up into the calf muscle. Um, and that fat or that subcutaneous tissue was desiccated, kind of all melted together. And so excised down to the fascia to see what the fascia actually looked like. This is an example of a chest and abdominal and extremity escherotomies, um, which is not all that uncommon, um, but it can happen. Um, when I look at this picture, I get a lot, or when I show this picture, people ask me, well, is this guy's back burned? And you actually already know the answer. Um, when we talked about those uh, circumferential thorax burns, um, that's why that chest escherotomy would be necessary. If his burn, if he was not burned on his back, um, that chest escherotomy wouldn't have been necessary. So, um, if we were to calculate this out, um, he's got no burns from his neck on up or from his waist on down. Um, we would calculate this out to about a 54% burn injury. Um, and uh, using that bow score formula, so his age is uh, 50 um, and he had no inhalation injuries, so his bow score would be 104. As I mentioned earlier at the beginning, um, that then that would be a survivable injury and he did survive. Um, he was with us a long time. He was with us almost three months, um, but he did survive that injury. <coughs> so a little bit about um, some different mechanisms. So thermal burns are, I mentioned, by far the most common. So that can be a flame, a scald, or a contact burn. Um, the uh, peak damage is going to occur about three to four days after. Um, these are often associated with other injuries, um, so it's important that the trauma aspect be taken care of. And the severity is going to depend on the temperature, the duration, and the enclosed space. So that duration is what we can influence uh, getting that fire or that burning process stopped as early as possible. This is a photo I referenced from a structure fire. You can see where that um, chest uh, has been burned. Um, they have that carbonaceous uh, deposits um, on that skin that's been injured. But again, a very scattered appearance. Um, why her flank and upper, you know, kind of part of that arm isn't burned, but other areas are, um, is anybody's guess. Um, so um, when we see that, we see those carbon deposits, we know it was some sort of uh, structure fire, maybe clothing started on fire, but certainly not a scald component. A scald or a liquid burn would not have those carbon deposits. Um, this is a full thickness thermal injury to uh, lower extremity. And again, full, th full thickness circumferential injury. You can probably appreciate the capillary refill to those toes is significantly delayed. Um, so uh, emergently, uh, we tried to do some escherotomies. We got through that skin to the subcutaneous tissue. That was burned on down to the fascia. That also sustained a thermal injury. and. Um, uh, down to the tibia, which was actually burned. So um, this patient uh, received a below the knee amputation. Um, we just uh, are not able to um, do enough surgery to save that extremity. This is a lady who was standing at her kitchen stove and started her nightgown on fire. Um, and uh, this is what you're going to see on arrival. You're going to see this dead hanging skin. Um, it's going to be distressing. Um, it uh, burns will make you often do things, say things, and think things that you normally wouldn't. Um, so that's why I think it's really important to just uh, assess this. Um, get your calculation of body surface area figured out and then get it covered up. If you find yourself debriding the sperm or wanting to wrap dressings on, um, you have other things that you need to be uh, concerned with and much higher priorities. Uh, don't treat the burn. We'll take care of the burn when the patient arrives at the burn center. This is a guy who was smoking with his oxygen on, um, not a all too uncommon injury, um, but uh, these patients often do actually pretty well. Um, so 
You can see the lines on his face um, on that left side from the nasal cannula. Um, the initial fire starts, it starts to melt that nasal cannula as the fire gets further away from the source. Um, uh, that's when the burning process stops and you can see um, that's what that line on his cheek is about. Um, these patients will often uh, 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 have a flash injury, so it'll be a quick fire and then it goes out, um, but they don't have an income inhalation component um, to their injury. Skull burns, uh, so children are most often at risk. They can be accidental or abuse injuries. 155 degree Fahrenheit uh, water in contact with your skin for one second can cause a full thickness uh, burn injury. Some of you maybe remember the McDonald's coffee story. Uh, McDonald's serves their coffee at 180 to 190 degrees. Uh, a lady was driving through the drive-thru, put the coffee cup between her legs as she was driving away, and um, the pop top of the uh, a cup popped off and um, spilled coffee onto her upper thighs um, and then uh, onto her perineum and on her butt uh, where she was sitting in the hot coffee. Um, so similar to a bathtub injury, if you would f get in a bathtub with 180 to 190 degree water, you could sustain a full thickness injury very quickly. Um, so we do a lot of uh, public surface uh, campaigns. We talk about bathing temperature no more than 100 degrees and uh, water heater temperature set no higher than 120 degrees. 120 degree water in contact with your skin for five minutes will cause a uh, full thickness injury. <clears throat> This is a classic dipping injury, so this injury happens from abuse. Um, it typically occurs around potty training accidents and um, the uh, caregiver has to get the kid in the bathtub uh, to clean them up from their uh, accident and they're gonna teach them that they shouldn't have potty training accidents again. <clears throat> so sometimes this water is actually heated up on the stove and then poured into a bathtub if the water heater uh, temperature is set low enough. If not, they can heal, fill the bathtub up with water and they'll hold the kid above water and dip them into the bath water and uh, they'll sustain the stocking pattern uh, burn appearance to the uh, bilateral feet. Um, the kid's reaction is to pull their feet out of that water and when they do that, they have skin on skin contact where water can't get to. So you'll see areas of spared on the backs of calves and then the backs of the lower part of the uh, thigh. Um, they continue to submerge the kid in water and so these kids will get anterior shin burns. Um, and then once the knees hit the water, they'll sit the kid back in, in water into the tub and uh, they'll get these uh, upper thigh and butt burns. Um, so it's important that the uh, injury pattern fit the story of what you've been told. Most often you're not going to hear that this kid was dipped in hot water. Instead you're going to hear the kid climbed in the bathtub or they were standing in the bathtub and they reached up and turned the hot water on. Um, it's important that you make that distinction um, and report that if you don't believe that the story is true. Don't be confrontational to the caregiver. Um, they called for your help so uh, they want your help. Um, you can, um, you know, I often say I don't really care how it happened. Um, my role now is to take care of this kid. Obviously, I do care how it happened, um, but I'm going to focus on the aspects of care and not, not care how it happened. Um, I'm going to uh, report that as a mandated reporter, um, whatever that means to you. Um, just make sure you do that because you are a mandated reporter. This is an accidental burn. This is a pull down injury. So this is when a kid uh, wants to see what's for supper and pulls down the pot of uh, hot soup on top of them. Um, so they get burns to their face or upper chest and usually to their dependent arms. So in this example, um, right arm was down. He reached up and pulled it down with the left, pulled the pot down with his left hand to his face and traveled down that dependent arm. Um, Again, uh, maybe it's accidental, maybe it's abuse. Um, we, um, uh, if there's any suspicion, certainly report that. Um, but this one turned out being accidental. This is a kid who was uh, sitting in an infant seat at dinner time on the kitchen floor. 
Um, Mom was making macaroni and cheese. She had the uh, noodles were done. We're uh, carrying them over to the colander to drain them and uh, water splashed, sloshed out of the pot and landed on this kid. Um, what you can't see are burns around the right flank and onto his back. Uh, we determined that to be an accidental injury. Um, uh, certainly some um, pub, uh, some awareness about having a kid on a kitchen floor uh, when you're carrying around hot water. Um, maybe that's not the best scenario. Um, but, um, uh, you know, determining the injury pattern fit the story for sure. Um, and then intent is always another harder uh, aspect. Was it truly an accident or was this done on purpose? So um, we refer a lot of our uh, child injuries uh, to child protection and let them kind of sort that out. I would just encourage you to do the same. Uh, report this to the hospital that you're providing uh, transport to and then let them uh, sort the rest of that out. Chemical burns can be occupational. They can occur secondary to salt. Um, it can be an acid, alkali, or proteum distillate. Uh, the severity really depends on that agent concentration, volume, and duration of exposure. And the one uh, factor that we can influence of those three is truly the duration of exposure. So getting that chemical off is gonna help um, uh, limit the amount of exposure and uh, the depth uh, uh, significance of that injury. Um, we do always want to hear about these patients um, because uh, different chemicals have different kind of onsets and different treatments and um, uh, we can offer some advice on how to treat those. So as far as first aid goes uh, with a chemical burn, uh, getting all their clothing off, flushing their eyes if their eyes are uh, involved. Uh, neutralizing agents are not indicated. Oftentimes if you find a um, acid uh, and you're gonna neutralize that with a base, uh, those two chemicals when they're combined will release heat and then you'll have a thermal injury on top of it. So don't spend a whole lot of time looking for that specific agent, just flush them with water. Um, this is what uh, oven cleaner on your skin can do. It can cause a full thickness injury if it's not removed immediately. So um, certainly full thickness injuries from chemical burns do happen. Um, electrical burns, I kind of talked about those at the beginning. So certainly we see some low voltage home injuries, but the ones that uh, get our attention more often are the occupational or high voltage injuries. Um, these uh, injuries are not often fatal, but they can result in some limb amputations. Um, this is a low voltage injury of a kid crawling around at Christmas time, chewed through an electrical cord and got what looks like a full thickness injury to that lip. Um, it ended up, uh, once we uh, got to the operating room and finally uh, kind of able to clean that up, um, it ended up actually being a uh, partial thickness burn uh, and healed up just fine. But I think what's interesting about this one, this kid had uh, some snap pajamas on and there was actually an arc component onto those pajamas as well. So um, uh, that was missed by the EMS providers. They were focused on the slip injury and uh, did not do a good head to toe exam um, and missed that chest injury. So again, distracting injury, uh, make you do things, say things, and think things that you don't normally do. Uh, try to put that aspect out of your mind and uh, do what you would normally do um, and not miss that chest injury. This is a high voltage injury. This is an electrical um, uh, line worker that came in contact with electrical wire. He had a crack in his glove and the current entered in through his hand. Uh, this is actually in the operating room. So our surgeons uh, went into the OR and uh, they start looking for bigger injuries. His arm was very edematous, which you'll see here uh, with the next slide. Um, but um, they opted to open up that web space in his thumb to look at what that tendon looks like in those underlying structures. A little hard to see, but on that palmar side, you can see that's what subcutaneous tissue should look like. It's kind of yellow globular structures. That flexor extender tendon of his thumb uh, looks great. Um, here you can appreciate the amount of edema that's present in that forearm. That's a simple incision with a scalpel and it balloons uh, wide open like that. Certainly appreciate the muscle edema. But again, the subcutaneous tissue looks great. The tendons on the back of his hand uh, look all um, uh, intact and um, functional. 
And then this is kind of this S incision. Um, again, looking at that muscle on the bottom side, uh, certainly quite edematous. Um, but all those structures look good. You can maybe appreciate the burn on his palm, which was full thickness and did to get a skin graft. Um, what we did with this guy is then uh, put some big retention sutures in his arm, got his arm up in traction until some of that edema was out, and then brought him back to the operating room and were able to close that uh, completely. Another type of uh, burns I mentioned earlier were radiation burns. So um, a sunburn is technically a radiation burn, uh, prolonged exposure. Um, but we see that in uh, cancer um, or x-ray treatments. Um, you can actually see some radiation burns. So this is a lady who underwent uh, mastectomy and then was getting cancer treatments and got these full thickness burns to her chest wall from the radiation treatments. Um, we have to be a little uh, cautious with these and just more conservative. Um, we can't excise and graft those right away and then send her back to the operating room. Um, otherwise, uh, uh, when they radiate again, they'll radiate that skin graft and that skin graft will uh, fail. So uh, some conservative treatment, typically till radiation treatments are over and then we can um, uh, excise and graft that. That's all I have. Uh, my contact number uh, for our burn center is uh, on the bottom there, 922-BURN, and then my uh, email address. Um, if you have any uh, further questions, feel free to reach out. Um, I appreciate your time.